Well, hello everybody. I'm very happy today to host uh, Michael Short with a webinar measuring extremely low radiation damage to materials for nuclear enrichment forensics. So Michael, welcome. And uh, I'm really, really honored to have you. Actually, if you don't mind, maybe I say a few words. Sure. Um, you are associate professor in nuclear science and engineering at MIT. Mm -hmm. And I know that you are really a material scientist and uh, as i told the already that i'm very honored to have you today uh, with us with your webinar thank you very much for your time well thanks a lot anna uh, and thank you everyone for tuning in let me just share my screen real quick and uh i'll get right into it so thanks anna for the introduction um my name is mike short i'm actually coming at you from uh pittsburgh at the materials and nuclear energy systems conference or mines which is the first in-person normal conference I've had in almost two years. So it's a delight to actually be here with humans in 3D. Uh, but I wanna thank you all for tuning in and hosting me as part of Generation Female. Um, so before getting, into, before getting into my talk, Anna, can you confirm that my voice is coming in loud and clear, please? Yes, everything is good. Great, okay. So before getting into the, the technical substance of my talk, I wanted to frame this talk with why I choose what I do. Because a lot of us scientists, we can, we can study whatever we want to, but what we choose to study is not so much a matter of technical anything, but it's more a matter of philosophy, personal philosophy and ethics. I was just asked to do this last week by another group at MIT to say, well, what guides you and which questions you decide to answer? Um, and since I'm Jewish, I had a very Jewish upbringing. It actually comes from my own personal upbringing. And I wanted to share with you a couple of quotes that have stood with me and have been kind of my guiding principles for what to study. They're both from a famous rabbi named Rabbi Hillel, and they've been translated into all sorts of languages, so you may have heard of these before. The first one reads, Im anili mili, mi mani, im ein shav imatai. Or in other words, if I'm not for myself, who will be? And if only for myself, who am I? And if not now, when? And to me, this is, an important guiding philosophy. The middle part that says, if I'm only for myself, who am I? My answer is I am nobody. Um, in watching a different YouTube video before, um, they were asking a bunch of philosophers, what is the meaning of life to you? And the one that stuck with me was the person that said, the meaning of life is being important to other people, doing things to help other people, helping those around you, helping those you don't know. That to me is where it's at. And then there's the simplicity of things. Uh, that which is hateful for you, do not do to your friend, or you may have heard this as do unto others, as you would have them do unto you. And combined together, these make me choose, despite the fact that I'm in nuclear, and there's a lot of contention around nuclear power, I'm in it for what I think is the right reasons, and that's to save the world. That's the one thing everyone around me at this conference says is we're in nuclear because we want to save the world, but there are aspects of nuclear which work against that philosophy, specifically those of nuclear weapons. And so in one of the things I decided to do is I don't work on offense. I don't do defense because that's in this country, a form of offense. And so the parts of nuclear that I work on are both nuclear power, but also trying to eliminate nuclear weapons. And this is what ties into these, what I call the energetic fingerprints of tiny amounts of radiation damage. This is a project co-launched by myself and my colleague, Scott Kemp, uh, best known as the technical architect of the US-Iran nuclear deal. He actually did the whole technical basis to make that happen. And I sure hope we'll get back into it soon with the goal of proving that Iran is not enriching any special nuclear material so that we could ratchet down sanctions and normalize relations between people. Because to me, there's no reason that the people should have to suffer because the governments are fighting. And if I can use my knowledge and technical skills to prove to the governments that they're not a threat to each other, then the people can not only start to stop suffering, but happily coexist. We have a lot of Iranian students at MIT. Um, and from everything I've heard, from everyone I've met, I've found them to be the most genuinely friendly, interesting, and amazingly scientifically literate folks I've ever met. Um, I would really like to find a day when the U.S. and Iran are friends, not enemies. And I hope this is what some of this research will help lead us towards. 
So the question I ask ourselves is, um, what is the lowest dose of radiation that gives us useful information from the point of view of verifying the US-Iran nuclear deal or reconstructing enrichment activities of different countries like, let's say, North Korea? <clears throat> Shown here is an image of what of these enrichment facilities looks like. On the inside, it consists of a bunch of fast spinning tubes, which isolate the heavier and lighter isotopes of uranium-235 in a UF6 or uranium hexafluoride gas uh, with the lighter gases containing more U-235 coming out the center and being enriched for either reactor fuel or for weapons fabrication. And our technique lies in the fact that at the walls of these centrifuges, alpha particles or little bits of radiation are being given off by the uranium all the time, imparting damage to the inner walls of these materials. And if we can then scrape off those inner walls and put them in some instrument and measure how much damage was done, we can reconstruct how much irradiation they, they incurred, how much UF6 flowed through, and therefore how many weapons a nation or state may or may not have made. To give a simplified view of what's inside here, um, you can think of this as just a tube containing gaseous molecules of two different isotopes of uranium. U-235 and U-238. And each one of these uranium atoms can randomly give off a high energy alpha particle, a helium nucleus, and a daughter isotope. And those alpha particles slam into the walls of the centrifuges, imparting damage. And the two questions we want to ask ourselves was how much of this stuff was made and what was its enrichment? If we know how much was made, we know the throughput of the facility. If we know the enrichment, we can distinguish between peaceful reactor fuel and nefarious nuclear weapons. We're focusing on a few different parts of the centrifuge and what we're gonna call the energy fingerprint of phase transformations. We could measure the energy directly of radiation defects, but this energy is pretty low, about 1.1 to 2 joules per gram for most metals. Instead, if we look at phase transformations that are changed by radiation, we get about a thousand times more signal, and therefore we can be a thousand times more sensitive. And to show you a rough diagram of a centrifuge facility, it consists of a bunch of cylinders, maybe made of a high strength aluminum alloy or carbon fiber. They're connected by a bunch of stainless steel pipes, and connecting those pipes are Teflon gaskets made of PTFE or Teflon, some sort of plastic that's resistant to corrosion by these uranium gases. And in choosing which materials to focus on, we decided to go for the low hanging fruit or the Teflon. Just to introduce what Teflon is, it's like a hydrocarbon, except that all the hydrogens have been replaced by fluorine, which makes it very chemically inert and it doesn't corrode when enriching this uh, UF6. So we irradiated pieces of Teflon in our particle accelerator. We've got one of these here at MIT with, oops, with uh, alpha particles about the same energy as you'd find in a centrifuge to three fluences or levels of radiation representative of what you might find from a tenth, one, or ten bombs worth of special nuclear material. The instrument that we use to make these measurements is called a differential scanning calorimeter or a DSC. At its essence, it's a heat capacity measuring machine. It measures the amount of heat that materials absorb as they rise or fall in temperature. And the way it technically works is you have a sample in a little aluminum pan inside this piece of the DSC and an empty pan of roughly the same mass. And you measure the amount of power required to keep the two pans at the same temperature. The pan with your sample in it has more mass and therefore is going to absorb more heat when you try to heat it. So now I wanna show you what these signals look like. Um, so I do see some questions coming in the chat. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll get to those in just a sec. I wanna show you what these signals look like so that you can see whether or not we can actually um, tell these differences. You st when you start off by measuring, let's say heating up or cooling down, you'll go through an initial transient where the instrument is sort of getting to know your sample, so to speak. You keep heating and establish a physical baseline and when you heat through some phase transformation, you're going to see a large energy absorption or release peak. This is gonna be the focal point of our study because radiation will change the shape and size of this peak. You keep on heating, 
draw a background baseline and the, the shape of the curve you draw is not so important, we found, as long as you're consistent. And then you can do some studies on this where you can look at the area of this peak to look at the total amount of energy required to melt the Teflon. You can extrapolate back to the onset temperature of melting or all sorts of different things in order to figure out what's going on. So I think I'll have, uh, I'll answer that first question. Do I have any government support or private investors for this research? The answer to that question is yes. About half of my research is supported by the US federal government. In fact, this project in particular is entirely government sponsored by the National Nuclear Security Administration and also the National Science Foundation. But about half of my work is sponsored by industry, whether this is large companies or startups. I don't have any private investors unless you count private companies uh, funding this research. And again, if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat. I'll try and address them as they come up. So when we look at these peak signals as a function of a radiation fluence here, you can see that the difference between the gray and the red, which is very lightly irradiated, you can't really see a difference. They're, they're roughly uh, coincident. But as we continue irradiating, these peaks start to separate. And when we do some statistics on these to look at the average and standard deviation of the enthalpies of recrystallization, we get our final result, which is that we can distinguish one bomb's worth of special nuclear material, and we can tell its enrichment very, very well. For example, if we were to find a facility that had processed 10 kilos or one weapon's worth of uranium hexafluoride, we can tell the difference between low enriched uranium, something that's safe to use as peaceful reactor fuel, and what's called the HEU or high enriched uranium limit. This is about 20% enrichment, and it's a safeguard set by the international community to say you're not allowed to enrich past this level because once you get there, it's easy to take that 20% uranium and enrich it further to 90% to make a weapon. We can tell that difference to pretty high confidence, approaching about 99% confidence. And we can tell the difference between reactor grade fuel and weapons grade uranium to much, much higher confidence. Because if someone is going to, let's say, justify relieving sanctions or on the flip side, accuse someone of enriching weapons, you should be extremely sure of that accusation. It's not enough to be 99% confident because lives, wars, peace, sanctions, prosperity, all hang in the balance of this technical assessment of somebody's enrichment capabilities. So I see in the, in the class, I'm sorry, in the chat, I see the question I mentioned that I go attack, not defense. In other words, I actually don't do attack or defense. I'm categorically opposed to doing research that will enable military action. In fact, the whole point of this research is to discourage military action and have some way to go in and inspect enrichment facilities with the point of view of normalizing relations between countries. The hope is actually to translate this out to the IAEA or the International Atomic Energy Agency with which we made first contact recently so that they can uptake it and use it in their inspections. Now, it is true that anytime you invent something new, others could use it for purposes you didn't intend. And this is something we do think about in our group. What are the ethics of anything that we would or wouldn't do? Um, it's, sometimes it's kind of convoluted. It might be a few steps in the future, but we try not to do anything that will lead to defense or especially offense applications. And then what's the price of corporate application of our findings? I don't know exactly how to answer that. I'd love if you could put that in the chat, maybe with some clarification, and I'd be happy to elaborate. And so then to get into the inspection technique, I want to show you some hot off the press results, where it's one thing to look at big pieces of Teflon, but if you were going to do an inspection, you would want to take tiny little pieces of material that wouldn't affect a country's ability to do any enrichment. And for that, we use a technique called nanocalorimetry. It's the same instrument, but on a chip, so that we do the same sort of measurements, but with 50 microns of material, we're talking hundreds of nanograms, where you can just slice out a little piece with a razor blade, remove it using a focused ion beam, place it gingerly on the top of this very, very small nanocalorimeter, 
And then the big question is, do we get the same results in the nanoscale as we do in the macro scale? And I'm glad to say the answer is yes. So shown here are our nano calorimetry data, which also give you an, a sort of a spoof proof ability. It's uh, if you think about would somebody what would want to do with this information, maybe they'd want to fool the inspectors. We have a few ways of preventing the inspectors from being fooled. Um, so shown in blue are the measurements we made by regular DSC and in black, the measurements made by this nano DSC and they match pretty well. Most important though, is the drop off at this red line, the range of the alpha particles in Teflon means that you can't use other sources of radiation to fake this measurement. And so we are trying to think about once we release these blueprints for inspection, we're also releasing blueprints for how to fool the inspection. How many physical safeguards could we have in order to prevent somebody from falsifying results? So that's where we are today. I know I've still got a fair bit of time left, but I intentionally would like to leave that to take any questions that anyone might have in the audience about the project itself, the guiding philosophy, how research goes at MIT, um, philosophies on sort of mentoring and bringing up the next generation of young scientists, especially in the nuclear field, which is the widest, malest field in STEM or science, tech, engineering, and mathematics, and what we're doing to reverse those gender disparities and URM disparities actively at MIT's Department of Nuclear Science and Engineering. So I see one question, what's next in the project? We're gonna be looking at all sorts of different materials because it's one thing to just say we can do this in Teflon, but we also have to be able to do that in any material found in an enrichment plant. The more materials we can do this with, the more spoof proof everything becomes. If you guys will excuse me, I'm just going to walk right outside the door, but I'll stay online just to keep answering your questions. Okay. So anyway, I'd love if uh, if anyone has any yes. other questions. Yes, Michael, chat, I have a question personally from me. Um, how many yes. percent, if you have percentage, or maybe in broad, you can tell me if any female support on this team on engineering and science and how it's organized in the MIT and precisely in your faculty? Sure. So the, the project team consists of a few graduate students, a few undergraduates, a couple of postdocs, a couple of collaborators, myself, and some international collaborators, both at other universities and hopefully soon at the IAEA. It just so happens that this project team, I'm, um, I'm only one of three men on a project team of about 12. This just kind of naturally occurred, didn't plan for that. But I think it is a testament to efforts my department is working on in order to reduce gender disparities in STEM, specifically to create a supportive environment in what's normally a male dominated field that's been full of sort of the old boys club, microaggressions and all the other things that may have made it historically a less welcoming place for women to work. And I'd like to think that this project is some evidence that things are getting better in this field. So did that answer your question, Anna? Yeah, I have another question, which uh, from auditory. They so uh, when you ask participant to give some explanation, I will read you here now. Mm -hmm. So I was mentioned Iraq story was example of what you said. We need real evidence. Your finding are giving 100% certainly of results. On a corporate level, big companies has big interest in this activity. My question was, why you still don't have corporate investments? This is from Rick. Aha, uh -huh. so thanks for the explanation. So I believe the reason we don't have corporate investors yet is I don't see a path to intellectual property protection on this particular project. It's a pure science project with a save the world ambition. But if it's not clear that someone's going to make a lot of money, it won't attract corporate investors. And that's okay to me. This to me is the is the real purpose of things like the NSF and the National Nuclear Security Administration. They take taxpayer dollars in order to fund research for public good without any shred of a promise of profit. Because that's the definition of a service, right? It expends money for the benefit of the public, kind of like the um, United States Postal Service. I know in the last administration, there was a lot of talk about how the USPS was losing money. It should lose money. It's a service. It, it's in service of the American people. Same thing with this sort of research is I don't think this is particularly attractive to corporate sponsorship because they may not make money off it. 
That's why we have the National Science Foundation. So okay. I hope that answered your question. Yes, I hope so. Um, for the moment, we don't have from auditory question, um, not yet. So I would like to, maybe we can wait a little bit uh, because we have time and in the meantime, I have again question from generation female, and I would be pleased sure. to, to work and partner and support your, um, your laboratory and research. And if we can partner and be helpful, I will be really happy to give you additional hands or maybe to bring your research to Europe and to show it a little bit more. I also will be very happy to help and to support. Thanks for the offer. I, I, that would be fantastic on two fronts. One, to spread the word of the projects that we're after, but two, also to bring more people into MIT. So we routinely host visiting students, visiting scientists, summer students, anyone in our department, if this is something of interest to you. Um, and then we are looking for actively for collaborators, where if there are other folks who are interested in working together on this project, uh, I'm all ears if you've got something technical or policy related or anything that I'm not thinking of to contribute. Um, if you've noticed, I talk about everything in my research. I don't hold things back, I'm not worried about being scooped, because the more we can do faster, the better. Um, so I've shown you all hot off the press data, hasn't even all been published yet, but doesn't matter to me. It's, uh, it's important to get it out there. Yeah. We received uh, two more actually uh, comments and one of them saying, great answer, Professor. We need more people like you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, so um, as we don't, let me just double check that we don't have question on the website yet. Uh, no, sorry, we have another question. Mm -hmm. Or is MIT recruiting talents around the world? Sorry, could you repeat that please? Mm. Is it MIT, Massachusetts uh, University, recruiting talents around the world? Absolutely. So half of our graduate students are US, half are international. And we don't, uh, we'll allow anyone from any country. Is And if you can enter the country, you can study at MIT. You still have to apply, uh, but we don't have any bias towards country of origin or anything else. OK, that sounds fantastic. So Michael, I would like to thank you for your time. I'm really very pleased to have you and I will be happy to collaborate and all our speakers who maybe uh, still would like to catch up or to see webinar or some small part of your big research. If mm -hmm. you don't mind, would like to leave our webinar on the website so people can still catch up and still have a question and I will come back to you if any other question or if somebody would like to stay in contact with you. Absolutely. Yeah. Please feel free to post it. And also feel free to share my email address with anyone who would like. Thank you so much for your time and for this lovely webinar. Thank you, Michael. Thank me. It's been a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Have a very good day and speak to you. Yep. Thanks a lot. Thank you.